this panel is to transition from the broad ideas and concepts of what Bruce presented in terms of the importance of global trade and investment to how places around the country are addressing that in very specific, actionable ways. And then our last panel will be about that transition reacting to what other places around the country are doing and these global trends, and how they might apply specifically in Detroit as a region collaborating to compete around exports and foreign direct investment. My name is Merrick Gutman. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Global Initiatives at Brookings, and I'm joined by colleague Brad McDearman. Brad is a recovering site consultant, and um, over the past several years, almost four years now, been working directly with metropolitan areas in the United States and increasingly internationally to explore how do you approach these issues of greater global engagement. Phyllis Campbell, Phyllis is the Northwest Chair for J.P. Morgan Chase, but also more significantly to this discussion, she's the Vice Chairman of the Global Cities Initiative overall, and she's been the leader in the Seattle region on how Seattle, Greater Seattle, can engage more in the global economy and specific actionable steps. Deb Shearer, Deb leads the Columbus 2020 Regional Private-Public Partnership around economic development for Greater Columbus, around global investment activities, and previously led the state of Ohio's activities around the same topic. And then Aaron Brickman, here is Senior Vice President now at the uh, Organization for International Investment, which represents more than 100 businesses that are investing in the United States and also has a long perspective in this issue, foreign direct investment and business interests, as the person who helped to organize and launch Select USA. So, Brad, I'd like to just start with you. As I said, you've been working on these issues for four years now, more than 30 places around the country. Um, what are some of the common topics and concerns and issues that have been raised by looking at global engagement around both foreign direct investment now and, and export activities? So I would start by saying the first question we get in every city is what's, what other cities are doing this great and what are the best practices? And I think what we've realized is that there really aren't any um, in terms of metro engagement, even at the state level. What we find is very fragmented uh, efforts, both on the export and FDI side in terms of service delivery. A lot of good players on the ground. You find good players at the Fed, state, and local level, but they're not always talking to each other, and there's not always a story that's been developed around all those pieces. So fragmented and siloed, even to the point where exports are in one box, FDI might be in another box, and they're not really integrated into the overall economic development effort. So I, what do you find from companies' perspective, and how, do you, how did you identify these issues? Well, from companies' perspective, all these were done through kind of market assessment and on-the-ground interviews with, with companies, and they, what we found basically is, and it's across all 28, even where there are good programs, most of the companies lack awareness that they exist. So there's a lack of awareness of global opportunities and what they should be doing, particularly in the middle market. The large firms know it, but the middle market and small firms don't know much about it don't know necessarily how to move into it and don't know how to relate uh, to the export services and FDI uh, promotion and efforts that are out so there. So you mentioned a market assessment. <clears throat> Can you just describe what the process has evolved from pilot sites that, uh, that started and how that has established sort of a, 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 a template for looking at these issues in metropolitan areas, city regions. So one of the first things you find when you go in these places, and I'd say all 28, they don't know themselves very well. Not only on the global side, but even internally on their industries and where they should be going, what their strengths are, what their assets are. They don't collectively know the story. So the first part of the planning process, and we're working with all 28 to develop global trade investment plans, we spend the first half to two thirds of that just doing a market assessment where you're looking deep into data that Brookings provides that they have on their own, but also going out and talking to companies and, and existing service providers. And I think most of the metros would tell you that the data is nice and the data helps you get some insight, but the company interviews are what really starts helping them understand that this is a lot about firm competitiveness and diversification and sustainability. And that's not 
what most economic development groups have focused on, bringing solutions to that piece of the puzzle. But it takes knowing yourself really well through a market assessment to be able to get to that point and have good regional discussions about it. So Phyllis, when Seattle start to evaluate its global competitiveness, you went through a benchmarking process that identified a couple of key issues. And I should say, Seattle in, in part is here representing a whole range of, of cities and regions that are going through this process from Los Angeles and Chicago to smaller places, very export intensive, like Wichita, um, to Des Moines, to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, Seattle has uh, an economy, I think, that looks a lot like Detroit in terms of it's dominated by a long history of exporting what it makes, dominated by a particular transportation, um, in, uh, transportation sector. Can you talk a little bit about what Seattle found is, and why you went through that process of benchmarking? Sure. Well, it, it is interesting. There are a lot of parallels between Seattle and Detroit, as you point out. You know, if I look back on just a bit of context for the audience, if I look back on Seattle's success, actually, I mean, sometimes I think we've been more lucky than good. And what I mean by that is that there's a real concentration, as you point out, of really two industries, aerospace and software uh, via Microsoft. And I always like to say to people, we're the economy of two bills, two bills who grew their businesses there, Bill Gates and Bill Boeing. And you know, it really has powered the economy, created ecosystems for us, much like the automotive industry in Detroit. But the fact of the matter is we have a concentration. Now we have a Jeff that moved to Seattle, Jeff Bezos. So, you know, but for Bill, Bill and Jeff, um, you know, I, I, we worry about the future and the future of our economy. So to your question, uh, a year ago, as you know, we had a convening much like this, the Global Cities Initiative uh, through J.P. Morgan and Brookings and, and really sat down. And I think it was a good wake up call for all of us. Because to your point, Brad, I, I don't think we had the research that really told us uh, what the economy going forward might look like. And a couple of insights that came out of that. First of all, we knew that we're a strong export economy. We're, we're one of the best in the U.S. Four out of ten jobs in this greater Seattle region are tied to exports. But what we didn't know, and I think it was a surprise and a shock, was that it, via the Brookings study, we saw in our foreign direct investment that only 4.6% of our private sector employment were tied to foreign companies that had invested in the greater Seattle region. So um, we're, we're right there with you. Uh, we, we really don't have a strong FDI economy. So I think a couple of things that came out of that, the interviews that you talked about, Brad, we engaged some of our economic development uh, agencies and partners to go out and interview companies that were there and ask, why are you here? What caused you to invest? What kinds of learnings can we have from um, the studies that we undertook as part of the Global Cities Exchange and Foreign Direct Investment. So um, just one anecdotal uh, story, and I think it, it, it may be instructive for this group, is that um, one of the interviews that I was involved with was with an uh, uh, entrepreneur named Ryo Kubota, who's a Japanese entrepreneur that uh, invested in actually a life sciences company in Seattle. He moved from Japan, came to the University of Washington first as a research scientist, um, the university really helped him with intellectual property transfer, he said. And he said, the other reason I'm here is because there's a great talent pipeline here via the Hutch, uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, um, University of Washington, obviously, uh, a real ecosystem of talent here. But he also mentioned cultural diversity because we, we tend to have a strong Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian population in Seattle. So, those were a couple of interesting stories. And then he said, and there was a process that really helped me transfer my IP into my company. And now he's, his company, Ocusella, is uh, one of the leading companies in macular uh, degeneration cures. So it was just an interesting story. But I think the knowledge base is something that's really been a wake up call for our area. And so when, when you went through that process, you identified FDI. I think that the number was, you were ranked 90th in the country in terms of FDI performance. Right. Then what was the, the next step? You went through the market assessment and then? Right, right. Yeah, and then I think a couple of, uh, the market assessment then uh, on particularly FDI is what you're talking about. Well, we went through, uh, again, we realized that we were low on FDI, but a couple key strategic planks that I just mentioned, there's a whole report. I think Detroit, now you have your report, but part of the, um, I think the aha and now the next steps that are coming out of it for at least our region are number one, we've got to have a much more purposeful process of cultivating 
uh, entrepreneurs, our uh, entrepreneurial, our talent ecosystem of people that are coming to Seattle naturally through the university, through tourism, through trade, export companies that already export. Executives are flying in and out of Seattle all of the time, but we really don't have a way of making sure that folks feel comfortable, stay in the community. So that's number one, is really cultivate that uh, talent uh, pipeline of investors that potentially could come to Seattle and start their companies. I think another big um, aha out of that, all of the um, studies that we did were just what uh, Bruce Katz talked about earlier was, how do we take uh, what are really advanced clusters and begin to really build an ecosystem around that? So when people come to the region, they know, like Rio Kubota, how to, they get resources on how can I start and move my company to Seattle or start my company in Seattle. It's pretty chaotic right now, or it's pretty, um, I suppose, uh, it's just disaggregated in terms of our ability to help these um, entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, we've got a lot of great assets, but we just don't have a strategy and a process for attracting this um, FDI talent. So Deb, in, in Columbus, you're one step um, further than where Seattle is because for like two, three years now you've been looking first at exports and then into foreign direct investment. Can you describe a little bit about where Columbus started in this when exposed to these global cities themes and how that's evolved for you? Sure. First let me talk about <clears throat> excuse me, um, exports and I'll break them up uh, both from the export and the FDI side. As an economic development organization we weren't really sold in the beginning uh, that exports should really be part of the economic development plan. We knew that it was important. The mayor was very supportive of it, but it really took a lot of buy-in to get people from the point where exports are about job creation, but it's a long-term investment for job creation. There's not going to be announcements. There's not going to be ribbon cuttings around it. But what we really tried to focus on the export side of things was the fact that it should be deeply integrated into our business retention and expansion efforts. So companies that are globally competitive, they pay better wages, they are more innovative, they're able to sustain their existence a lot longer. So integrating that into our daily uh, efforts to retain companies and to grow our companies that are already in the region was critically important. So introducing them to resources that were available to help them go that next step in export became um, integrated into our daily efforts. From the FDI side, when we went through our market assessment, there were three items that really uh, stuck out to us. One was that um, Unbeknownst to us, mergers and acquisitions were a major portion of how FDI started. Um, where I think that a lot of regions and cities get a little bit caught up in mergers and acquisitions being a little bit scary. Um, that a company is going to come in and take everything out through that merger out of their city. What we found is in a lot of cases, those mergers and acquisitions were an infusion of capital and those companies grew. So that was one surprise that we had. Another was that, um, not necessarily a surprise for us, but, but a finding that um, became very evident by the numbers, which is that we are heavily concentrated um, by geography with Japan. So Japan is a very large portion of our portfolio of foreign-owned companies. 60% uh, of our deal flow last year was by Japanese companies, and we really needed to start to diversify some of that geography. So making sure that we didn't have all of our eggs in one basket, and, and we're continuing to work through those efforts. And then lastly, um, networks and relationships really do matter. Um, we have 6,000 international students studying at The Ohio State University. That's something that we have not done a really good job of, of tapping into in the, in the past. And so we're working on efforts through that. All of our companies, well, not all of our companies, but we, a, a large portion of our companies have a very deep global supply chain, some of which would like to see that supply chain more local. We weren't tapping into those efforts. And um, just, you know, the day-to-day -day travel of service providers, multipliers, things like that. <clears throat> that that are going around the world that have touch points 
in various places. We really need to engage them to be um, ambassadors for the Columbus area and make sure that if they are speaking with people who are considering a foreign direct investment into the U.S., that Columbus is, is certainly um, what we would like to think on the top of their list. So one, one quick question. You said, on follow-up, you said that this required some convincing, right? Was there, what, what were the elements that led to change in perspective on, oh, well, we should be thinking about exports. It's not just a state function. I mean, you came from the state. It's not just a state function. It's not necessarily about federal government providing enabling environment for free trade agreements and, and, um, and or simple trade missions. What was it that triggered for the Columbus business and political leadership that exports was a critical, a critical focus in economic development? I'll give you one example. As we started, one of the goals, we, Columbus 2020 has four overarching goals that we're trying to achieve, um, one of which is increasing the per capita income of, of our citizens uh, by 30% by the year 2020. And when we look at pay, for example, of export-driven uh, jobs, export jobs pay 62% higher wages than jobs that are not engaged in export in the Columbus area. That is certainly a huge step in helping us to achieve our overarching uh, four goals by the year 2020. Thanks. So Aaron, you work with international investors, international businesses. Um, these are some of the activities happening at the city region level, um, economic development organizations, intermediaries. For, what is the international business perspective, what's the case? And when they're looking at investment opportunities in the United States, what are they thinking about as priorities? So as, uh, as, as Bruce walked us through a lot of the data, there are two kinds of investment. There are greenfield projects, uh, and then there are mergers and acquisitions. And mergers and acquisitions can go a couple of different directions. Uh, so, so companies, sometimes they're, they're choosing, uh, really, uh, from scratch, where to invest. And sometimes they are looking at opportunities and make a choice as to whether or not that makes a business sense. But overall, companies, so our member companies, 170 of the most uh, successful, dynamic global companies with investments in the United States, uh, they're looking at, at a region, they're looking for a dynamism, drive, vision around uh, internationalization. So how, how a region speaks global, if you will, how they understand global. Uh, how they're working collaboratively. Those kind of things matter, and, uh, and it's a competition. Again, as Bruce pointed out, this is not nation versus nation so much as it's region versus region. And Detroit's competition uh, is vast, uh, as, as is uh, Columbus's, and it crosses borders. So uh, speaking global is one thing, but then acting globally is another thing. And it's not just about attracting the companies in but creating a supportive environment. Companies want to know that they're being cared for after they arrive here, so that word aftercare, uh, very important. They want to know that a region and a city, a metro, understands uh, how the company works, what drives them, how they will fit in and contribute to that regional economy, who their partners are, um, and, uh, and uh, really, uh, it's not cliche to say they really want to be wanted they, they want to form part of that uh, ecosystem. Uh, companies care about incentives, but that is absolutely not top of the list. All things being equal, incentives can tilt an investment one way or another, but there are other factors that are at least as important, if not more so. Uh, and I think top of that list um, are, are a few of these factors I've talked about, as well as uh, presenting a non-discriminatory environment. So companies pay attention to what uh, politicians say, to uh, the, the general sense in terms of the, the openness, the welcoming uh, that uh, the international investor community receives. So presenting a non-discriminatory environment with regard to, to tax. Uh, so uh, presenting a non-discriminatory environment with regard to procurement. Uh, some states uh, think that in a vacuum they can expand by America provisions, which uh, really limit uh, not just 
uh, opportunities for U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies, these foreign-owned establishments that we're talking so much about, but really any company with a global supply chain. And there is no such thing as a vacuum. So uh, uh, these, you know, word gets out, and with 49 other states uh, in which to invest, or hundreds of metros in which to invest, that non-discriminatory, welcoming environment really does matter, and those issues are really top of mind for our member companies. So you distinguish a couple of different elements in there that for a domestic company attraction versus the international, uh, an international perspective. Um, one is that, that issue around the policy enabling environment or procurement topics that, that, that may um, impact internationally owned companies or subsidiaries of internationally owned companies in a different way than domestic attraction, right? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, again, it's one thing to uh, want FDI, uh, and uh, many metros have comprehensive economic development strategies. Uh, but it, what is still unusual is for there to be a robust FDI strategy as part of that, targeting inbound companies. And even more so, as you know, as well as anybody, tying together the export strategy with that FDI strategy. This connecting of the dots is not a no-brainer, even though it really should be, it must be for metros that want to be globally competitive. U.S. subsidiaries of, of uh, foreign companies, these inbound companies, um, they uh, don't want to be treated differently, but oftentimes you must cater to them as a region uh, differently. They don't want to be separated out, but oftentimes it might, might take a separate team to cater to them, to speak their language, uh, you know, pun intended sometimes. Uh, and, and then they want to be part of the team. They want to contribute in the same ways that domestic, uh, homegrown U.S. companies face. So, so Brad, the, the initiative, Global Cities efforts, started with exports and then expanded on to FDI. And building on what Aaron just said, can you talk a little bit about that integration and, and what, handling the separation functionally and, and, and even um, the approaches that people take to, if they have thought about exports at the, at the regional level versus this activity around foreign direct investment, what you've seen from working with places? You guys hear me? There we go. Um, all six metros that have gone through the FDI piece, they all go through, we got 28 in, all go through exports first, other than Seattle, which was one, the only one that went the diff, uh, reverse way, um, and then came in with FDI. All six of those had the option to do separate export and FDI plans or to merge it. All six chose to merge it once they got inside of the project. The more they knew data on FDI and on exports and talked to companies, they really started seeing that the clusters are the same. The clusters that export are the clusters where there's FDI being invested, um, whether through mergers and acquisitions or through Greenfield. On the mergers and acquisitions side, that's made them start to realize what an important business retention expansion effort this is. And on exports, so what Deb was saying about Columbus, they're both realizing that they need to get out and talk to companies to help them be more competitive based on expanding their exports but also a lot of those companies need the cash infusion that they might get from an acquisition uh, and the distribution channels for a, from a foreign firm. So it, all these things started tying together and FDI and exports started to merge, even if the approaches might be a little bit different. Um, so I think all of them are going to be heading that way and I think most of our key findings start to relate to how one of the key points is how FDI and exports really mix. And so uh, one of the p pieces distributed in addition to today, in addition to the city and regional specific foreign direct investment analysis that we, we did, um, was an exact summary of 10 lessons from this process. And you mentioned a couple of them. What are some other key areas? What are the real opportunities that people are thinking about a collaborative effort in greater Detroit on this? that are, again, common across whether it's, um, whether it's Houston or Philadelphia or Portland? I think for what metro areas can impact, the middle market becomes a big piece of that puzzle because your largest firms are already out there. They're, they're already global. They've got staff to manage global. They're looking at acquisitions and they're exporting. But the middle market are really those firms that are ready, they're innovative, they've got a product ready to go, they've grown and proven themselves. So that proved true across uh, the board and it helps you to kind of define what, what companies you should be looking at and what industries. Um, 
once again, this BRE effort that falls in with that. And then I'd say a big thing, and I think it's something for Detroit to really think about, is specialization. So almost all of these metros really had to sit and think about what do we do well on a global scale? And realize that that's what gives you your reach. So you know, what you've got with aerospace and software in Seattle helps you to get out there. There was some friction with that because some folks don't want to pick favorites. They want to say we want to, we want to sell everything we've got to everywhere. But I think we found example after example, and I'll give one. Portland is very heavily export intensive on the computer and electronics side. So Intel's a big player. It's what drives them to the top the same way auto drives you up high on your exports. They put together, they realize we need to protect that, but we also want to diversify. So they looked at the numbers and figured out who they really are. Next is we build green cities. They're all about um, urban innovation, urban uh, planning, uh, architects and engineers that do this, all the way down to green roofs, uh, solar panels, all of that. They took that for the first trip to Japan, had overwhelming success with it, and that's actually resulted in signed deals uh, to help build a model city in Japan. A lot of those Japanese firms have now been back and are looking at foreign direct investment, so it automatically translated this next cluster. And interestingly, it led to uh, them bringing their athletic and outdoor the next year. So they just brought athletic and outdoor. There's so you have Nike, Columbia, Kane, and they're kind of building this Portland brand with a focus on Japan. Um, they just got a 20-page spread in their GQ uh, version of uh, GQ magazine in Japan. They're getting a lot of attention for this, and they're able to spread it out. So, um, and we've seen example after example like this where places are realizing once they get inside of the numbers that they need to build with specializations and diversify. So, uh, so in Detroit, if you look at the export profile, it's a strong export economy, similar as we, we talked about a little bit with Seattle. But beyond that, the auto, the dominance of the auto sector, or in Wichita, first, second, third most export intense uh, economy in the country, they start to look at this because of that diversification issue, right? The same issue, and I think if I use the Portland example and Wichita, you still take good care of what you've got that got you there. And I think Portland almost went off a little bit and said, ah, Intel's got it covered. We'll start to just look at the next ones, and they started realizing, no, we need to really take care of what we've got. Um, and we're seeing that in others. And Minneapolis is really doing this with med tech now, but also even on the geographic side, and you guys should pay attention to Canada. They started realizing that is our number one by far trade partner. They didn't have a trade office in Canada. They had them in three other countries or three other continents where they were trying to do things, um, but really didn't focus on Canada, which absolutely dominates their relationship. So it's taking care of what you've got, but also really looking at these numbers and figuring out where's the next rising piece that could also represent. So this is a, it's a slightly different approach. Instead of saying a trade mission, India is a growing market. Who wants to come to India with us this year? It's more sectorally based, more targeting about where the existing relations are to build upon. Is that fair? especially with some with a new piece? Figure out where you are, where you really your bread's buttered on the one hand. So they're looking at both industry clusters, but also at target geographies, but not covering the world. And I'll give one more little example. Minneapolis thought that they had great relationships culturally with Scandinavia, and they do. It's, it's their background. But they had almost zero foreign direct investment coming out of Scandinavia. And there's been a lot of investment in the US. So they're well below average. And it's one of the things they really want to think about. How do we leverage all our relationships there um, to, to grow that, and why has that been happening? So they're focused on Canada, but then looking at those next set where they really should have more investment that they didn't know uh, wasn't happening. So a, a big challenge to this actually has been civics, right? In, 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 the, in every one of these metropolitan areas, even with long histories like the San Diego of you know, the great intermediaries, great industry associations, so there's been this question about fragmentation um, both among the providers and also politically. So, I mean, Seattle has this, um, everyone thinks the Northwest is a wonderful collaborative place where everybody's holding hands together. Um, but you have Seattle versus other regional, even city centers is less this downtown versus the suburbs than a, a multiple um, interests and is in the same situation in Columbus. Could, Phyllis, could you talk a little bit about this question about organizing and um, what the role of the private sector has been in overcoming this political balkanization? Sure. Well, I, I, I think it's an important question because when Bruce said earlier, collaborate to compete, especially in the metropolitan context, that couldn't be a more important phrase for all of us to remember. And I think in our region, uh, we've had a history of balkanization, especially politically. And 
though Seattle, the city of Seattle, like the city of Detroit, is the focus, we have multiple jurisdictions, counties overlaying the city. We have, um, you know, basically a, a lot of different organizations, uh, nonprofit organizations, EDCs, different folks all trying to do a lot of the same thing. And it just grew up again, as I mentioned earlier, just by kind of an accident of history. So I think one of the things that was a lesson for us a year ago when we had our global cities meeting um, like this, as you recall, we had three mayors, uh, mayor of Seattle, the mayor of Everett, and the mayor of Tacoma, three very different jurisdictions, but we're all, you know, all within, say, a, a 70 mile proximity, really stand up and sign a pact that said, you know, if, if we're gonna compete in the global economy, it can't just be about the city of Seattle. So a couple of points I'd make here is that I do think the regional umbrella is something that's really important for, uh, it was, it's been important for us to think about and we're still working on it. But the, the umbrella needs to have in my mind kind of the three strong spokes as we think about it. First of all, obviously political and, and you're very fortunate to have a tremendous mayor here as you all know. Uh, but I think there's many other jurisdictions that probably need to come in under this umbrella on the political side. So who are those other key players? And we're wrapping uh, a number of elected officials into our, what's now being called Challenge Seattle Strategy for Global Cities. The second spoke is obviously the nonprofits and the universities. So Community Foundation here, Miriam Nolan's a good friend of mine from my former days in the Community Foundation field, but Community Foundations, for example, can play that catalyzing role with philanthropies and other foundations, private investment, but also obviously the universities and the examples that we've all talked about. And the third strong spoke to your question is the private sector. And we felt in uh, the greater Seattle region that the private sector really needs to drive this. So we had a meeting, which was probably one of the first meetings in a long time of all of our major CEOs about six months ago and said, you know, it's time for all of you, not your, you know, government affairs folks or anybody else, but you as the CEO of all of the name companies that you know in Seattle, for you to personally get involved with global cities and help us identify the clear strategies, the players, the investment, and um, you need to be the investor council. And so we're right now almost in the process of raising, uh, we've got about 12 out of uh, 20 million raise for a seed fund basically to seed this challenge Seattle, which will become kind of the, really the catalyst for reaching across to the political and nonprofit and university sectors to start to drive some of the things that we're talking about, including FDI strategies. So the private sector, I, you know, I think we all agreed, we got buy-in and amazingly, you know, I think everybody said, we're not only gonna put our time, but we're gonna put our money. So we're just getting started, you know, I'll give you a report in, in a year or so. Yep, Deb. I, I just wanna comment from a regional perspective, you know, our economic development practitioners um, were on board. But it was also critically important that our shared partnership with the state's export program and the feds with their USIAC program were also all on the same page. And so it, it took a lot of conversations to really bring all the different parties that had a piece in it together to decide who was gonna lead the effort because there needed to be a leader. But then also not to just leave the leader out there hanging to realize that uh, when 2020 said we're gonna lead the effort, that we're not um, saying it's, out, it, it, you know, it's 2020's goals, right. but it's everybody's goals together. Right, so please, it, go. Yep. Just because it came up, it, performance measurement became one of the big issues here because all the organizations she just talked about, whether they were all local or the Fed or the state, they all had different performance measurements that didn't align up towards any particular regional goal. They were check marks, and sometimes the check marks competed. And if I let go of this lead or this opportunity and turned it over to someone else that would maybe have been a natural, naturally better fit, I lose my check mark with how I'm judged. So in this era of everybody wanting to do more and more performance measurement, um, it's become, in a way, this was part of breaking down that civics and say, how can we get common goals, common measurements where we're all doing this for all of us? And that's a real civics exercise, and it's had to happen really in all 28 places. If it hasn't happened yet, it's gonna happen in each one to figure out how we do one for all. Uh, and once you get there, and to get there, it takes the leaders that 
we were just talking about. It can't just be the practitioners on the ground. They need the support of their leaders to start thinking about this in a different way, not just checks of jobs added or checks of ribbon cutting, but competitiveness, sustainability, and diversification of existing firms, which is really what the firms told us. That's a whole new dynamic for economic development to deal with. Could I just add one Please. more thing? I forgot to mention, too, that when, one of the things we did in a benchmarking prior to the Global Cities uh, launch that we had last year was we benchmarked ourselves against eight global cities, not, not domestic, actually. There were, I think, few, three domestic cities, but the majority of them were global, Melbourne, Stockholm. So I think what we said is we don't aspire just to you know, compete internally because we really collaborate more with our partners through the Global Cities Exchange domestically. But how do we compete in the global economy from economies that we call mid-sized mid global cities? So the data was really important, and it's going to be something that we're going to have a continuous benchmarking process. And are we moving the needle on infrastructure? Are we moving the needle on workforce skills? So I think the data is really, really key. Right. And, and, and it's, I think the point, th there are a lot of organizations already in place, even if exporting is not typically an integrated part of an economic development strategy for a region. There are lots of good providers of services. In fact, I think in, in most places when, when the evaluation, the business interviews and surveys, if they were receiving services, everybody ranked them highly. I know Automation Alley is very successful and has a lot of good results here in Detroit, but it was more of a question in terms of the integration about an acceptance that this is just not, I'm not, I'm doing a good job, but I need more assistance. I, it, it'd be leverage mm -hmm. to greater advantage if more people were focused on this, right? I, I would just say in our case, um, like you said, when the company said that they'd utilize services that were available, they found them to be very good. The challenge that we faced is half the companies didn't even know the services were available. So with having our economic development practitioners really engage in this effort and um, take it out to the local level. You know, we had 50 more ground troops on the ground who were meeting with companies on a regular basis and really trying to, to fill that pipeline for both the state and the federal level. Right, so I'm gonna take questions in just a second. I, you changed the way that you operate in a couple yeah. of different, on, and, we started talking, we talked a little bit more about exports and foreign direct investment. Maybe you could describe through this process of self-evaluation and coordination with the region some of the tactics that you've identified be useful um, that are distinctive because you went through this strategic planning effort. Okay. I'm, and I'm going to talk just specifically a little bit more about Asia and our efforts in Asia and, and FDI there. So, you know, one of the things that came out of our market assessment was that relationships, the building of trust, was extremely important. Also that this is not something that you go to a country to one time and then um, you forget about it and you just expect companies to come. It's a long-term investment. Uh, one of the experiences we had in the Chinese market is I often like to say sometime, the front door sometimes is located through a side entrance. Um, China for us was a market that we really just started to engage in. The practices of doing business significantly different. We were constantly being asked by Chinese companies, we want to see your portfolio. We want to see your portfolio of investment. And so what we found is if we were able to put together a portfolio, which included real estate, uh, infrastructure, investment, um, startups that were looking for an infusion, infusion of capital. That got us through the side door, which sometimes allowed us to uncover greenfield opportunities, which is really what we were focused on to begin with. So approaching things in a different way and what's most appropriate in that particular country or um, culture can lead you back to what you were initially looking for. And then you just, I, I think, when we were talking at dinner last night, you, you described there was an also this integration between exports and FDI that you've discovered be, by starting to bring them together. Absolutely. Right? So this uh, Monday and Tuesday, I had a company in from China in Columbus. Their main purpose for coming to the market was to identify sources of U.S. medical products that they could then 
have those companies export to China and they could introduce them into the hospital systems. So they were in the Columbus area meeting with several companies and um, the Bioscience Association. What was interesting about that is their whole purpose and what they set up front was, we want U.S. exports. By the end of the first day, the conversation really started changing also into, hmm, what's the tax situation like right in Columbus? How could I potentially invest in this market? So what came in the door as initially being an export opportunity could potentially be both an export and an investment opportunity. I'm going to get back to Aaron in a second, but I'm going to check and see if there are any questions in the audience. All right, and if you think of any, we have just a few more moments. But I do have, uh, going back to the international business perspective and maybe raising it up, because so many more, so many more mayors have been involved in this discussion about trade than over the past five years. The evolution, the, the there's a, obviously everyone knows there's an enormous debate uh, going on at the federal level about free trade agreements and processes. So, Aaron, from your perspective nationally and, and working with these businesses, um, what, what are you seeing specific to this question about trade agreements, the value of them, um, and, and, and some of the negative aspects? What's, what's your view? Well, uh, going back to the, uh, one of the earlier comments that Brad was making, I, I think, uh, uh, and I, I will get to that, that point because it's a very important one, given the significant amount of FDI the U.S. receives in the form of M&A, it's important for regions to have an M&A strategy so mm -hmm. that uh, uh, not to uh, lament the acquisition when it happens, but to figure out what it means in terms of an opportunity. So you've lost a global headquarters, probably, you might have a regional headquarters that can then expand its footprint. So uh, uh, oftentimes metros do not have uh, that M&A that strategy, partners align, resources, how are you gonna then stand behind that uh, potentially expanding investment, it's critical. And in addition, uh, in terms of that aftercare point again, given that so much of US FDI comes from existing investors, it is so important to know what you have and what those companies need in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of that success that they seek. Uh, they are your region's best ambassadors. They are the ones who speak to their peers, their supply chain back home. Uh, it is so important to your question for metros to promote policies conducive to global linkages, to be on the right side of, of that internationalization uh, that will be, uh, those positions are then synonymous with your metro. So uh, OFI, my organization, uh, Organization for International Investment, released a study this week showing the economic impact that uh, TPP and TTIP, those two significant trade agreements, the economic impact those two will have because of increased FDI in the United States, which is not uh, often talked about. With, with full implementation, it will mean over 1.4 million jobs in the United States, uh, including about 37% in manufacturing, about 40,000 here in the state of Michigan. And, uh, and this is a significant impact. Also comes with about $175 billion in, in new uh, capital expenditures, also quite important. So these conversations happening far off in Washington matter for the regional economic competitiveness uh, for places like Detroit and metros throughout the United States. Right. Deb, and then I'll take uh, one question. I, I would just say that um, I, I agree with what Aaron's saying. I had an instance where I was working with a Japanese company recently and they were trying to determine from a North American service perspective whether it made sense for them to be in um, the U.S. or Mexico. Columbus was one of the locations that um, was in consideration. Ultimately, they chose to um, go to Mexico. Several reasons involved in that, but one of the reasons that they offered was that Mexico had a significant amount more trade agreements that had been negotiated, and so they were able to reach a far greater market in a more competitive way than locating in the U.S. So, so I would just add that from uh, this kind of uh, best practices conversation from the voice of industry, these successful global companies in the United States, 
we want to uh, bring those perspectives to economic development organizations throughout the United States. Uh, we were urged to do this by our companies because they encounter EDOs that are not quite equipped to, to manage those relationships. So we created the FDI Frontlines Coalition just around that discussion, this very narrow discussion around what business seeks and how business uh, frames that, uh, that uh, discussion, which can be uh, just very important and impactful for communities throughout the U.S. Good take. One question trying to catch up on our time. Yes, please. Good morning. Uh, this question is about transportation. In Detroit, we have a big issue. Once we have a workforce that gets trained and certified to fulfill jobs that are in demand, we run into those follow-up hurdles on cars, driver's license, cost of insurance. Are there other cities that have success overcoming the transportation hurdle? I think there, there are a lot of different there are a lot of different issues that have come up around transportation, goods movement, infrastructure, and, and so on. Maybe Brad, give it. I little. can give. I think what we're finding is that this kind of a process is forcing those issues to the top. So, for example, Intel needs to ship its stuff out just in time, and there's a bridge between them and the airport in Portland that was really just looked at as a bottleneck for them in the daily rush hour, and they've started to realize it actually impacts their exporting potential and it's the biggest exporter and one of the biggest employers in Portland. So it's given it a whole new lens on how they're looking at transportation. It's a jobs generator for them. And they had to address this for Intel, or Intel said we're going to have to move this production somewhere else because it's got to get over there. So they've got some short-term ideas on how to fix it, but that bridge is not just an infrastructure piece now. It's, it's about job generation. And I would say infrastructure, workforce, and also perhaps economic inequality have become three of the issues that a lot of these metros are, going to, are wanting to discuss in follow-on post putting these plans together. So the plans are a start, and they really help to get them to know themselves well, and it's really important, but these issues will rise up and require more study. And Portland, by the way, did a full freight study, uh, goods movement study, based on this for their whole region relative to the port, the airport, and how this fits. So. One of the things we found was that out, at least in our area, I think we're, we, at least if we're not the third most congested metro in the U.S., we're at least in the top five. So, you know, this whole global cities um, effort, the benchmarking I talked about, showed that on infrastructure, we're one of the, you know, really, the, that's, that's our weakness. So it really has catalyzed, I think, the, again, the public, the private, and the nonprofit sector to come together around how do we fix our transportation system and, and invest because I think all of our cities have underinvested for so many years. So the, so the entry point then has been around something non-controversial region exporting, everybody can benefit from it. It's moved on to once that base has been setting around this question of foreign direct investment where people do squabble around where does that actual investment go but then have realized through the process that it's about more collaboration and, and projecting a unified regional um, asset base than it is about which individual jurisdiction. And then it's linked up into these other issues or traded sectors generally. What are you doing around trade and investment? How do you support those industries that are going to generate the most jobs and have, require workforce or infrastructure or these other, other um, elements to help you be more of a trading city? Is that and I would just add. Probably no place exemplifies this better than San Diego, which is an example up there. Their region is now San Diego, the region, plus the Tijuana side. So it's Cali Baja. They're really pushing that as a main strategy. So to the Mexico issue, there's a lot of manufacturing going on there. They can put that there, and everybody's fine with it. The R&D and headquarters might be on the U.S. side, but they can leverage free trade agreements. It's a true partnership. Um, and even for them, they've got a strategy on life sciences with the M&A because these companies from Asia are coming in, buying life sciences, and actually growing them as a beachhead. So they heard from these firms, we want to be in San Diego. We're buying into your cluster. It's our beachhead in the US. But it means great aftercare. They've got to get inside of those and relate to the local and the parent company in ways they never thought of before. Thanks. All right, I'm going to have to end it and be a reasonable moderator. Uh, but the <laughs> panel will be around after this is over. And I think happy to talk to anyone who wants to come up to us 